Among all of the useless discussions that populate the internet lifting space, there is none more brain rotting than the debate between high intensity training cult zealots and, well, everyone else. For those not in the know, the cult of high intensity took two bodybuilding figures out of thousands and decided to hold them up on a pedestal as if their career represents the pinnacle of strength training. I am of course talking about Mike Menser and Dorian Yates. Mike was a pro bodybuilder and an extremely well-spoken ambassador of the sport. Yates was one of the greatest who brought in a paradigm shifting physique and both of them trained with some iteration of a high intensity approach. The root of the ideology that gives birth to all of the variations is the belief that the muscle taken to failure has experienced sufficient enough of a stress in order to grow and that that must mean that everything beyond that point is without point. Doing a thoroughly challenging all out set for each muscle group is enough and that allows you to have shorter, more efficient workouts and train each muscle group more frequently throughout the week. I have heard the word and it is good. Like any religion, a small bit of truth was taken and used to justify the existence of 9,000 different denominations, all preaching subtly different things. On the list of things that hit fanatics don't agree on is how much work is too much, like when Mike Menser argued that Yates was still doing too much work, as if the point of training is to absolutely do the bare fucking minimum. They disagree on what constitutes failure. Is it not being able to complete a rep at all, or is it some complete scorched earth annihilation of the muscle on a chemical level? And they also disagree on what techniques should be used to reach this level of fatigue. There are vicious debates over fatigue techniques like drop sets, tempo, force reps, how much weight you should use, and so on. The current representatives of the Heaven's Gate cult of lifting that is high intensity training cite Mike Menser and Dorian Yates routinely as being the shining examples of what training should be. Yet they promote training that is substantially different from the strategies that both Mike and Yates actually leaned on. One such guru in the current atmosphere adamantly argues against the forced reps and drop sets that men's are used to reach full exhaustion within the muscle, calling it unnecessary nonsense. This individual promotes super lightweight, super slow tempo lifts that last well over a minute. Like who wants any pesky strength adaptations to go with their hypertrophy? And he claims that reaching the point of failure is good enough on its own. Now, high intensity as an approach has validity, but the movement has showed that it has scraped the bottom of the barrel when droves of run of the mill gym goers hop online and proclaim that in the name of the king, hit is the only way to train. So this is my call to sanity. I'm going to provide a defense for the methods used for size and strength by literally every professional sport and strength program that has to do with building a muscle. I don't mean that like a small majority, like 53.4% of football players, bodybuilders, and Olympians utilize volume. So there, I mean like 95 plus percent of the best performers in the world utilize volume as a primary tool that allows them to grow mass. And in some sports, in some cases, it really is 100%. Here are the 10 reasons why volume is still the granddaddy of all training variables. Reason number one, volume allows for more skill development, which means better performance, which means more mass. Skill is kind of a weird word. We generally think of it as proficiency, like having a certain knowledge of how to do something along with the rare physical ability to do it. Things like surgery, gymnastics, debates, all require a great deal of skill, but strength is kind of a skill. The same neurological changes that make a gymnast coordinated are the ones that make someone more efficient in a squat or allow them to recruit a greater number of muscle fibers at once on a weighted dip. Because of that, strength work can be dismissively, almost insultingly referred to with the snotty tone like, oh, you're just getting better at the movement? That's just skill work. Real training involves taxing the muscle. Regardless, these neurological changes happen best when compound movements are practiced through multiple sets. The effect is large and it happens very quickly in just about everybody. For many lifters, these early strength adaptations they get from run of the mill practice can be the thing that leads to really rapid muscle growth. By being stronger, more weight can be used for typical hypertrophy work, which in turn creates a much bigger growth stress. If you can bench 50 pounds more, it stands to reason that you're going to be using a lot more on your dumbbell flies and cable crossovers. That's not to say that you can't get strong on a hit approach, but it is to say that for some, it might be the long way around. Reason number two, more work equals more mass. This is regularly witnessed in traditional periodization programs where lifters who are peaked from their most recent meet are actually deconditioned to high training volumes and actually are a little bit smaller and have a little bit less mass than they did at the start of the training program. When they restart a cycle with high training volume, more sets, more reps, lighter weight, short of failure, a very crazy thing happens. They build a lot of muscle. 
So if a power lifter or Olympic lifter who is concerned solely with skill acquisition can build muscle just by doing more skill work, what does that mean for a bodybuilder using more specific movements in a hypertrophy specific rep range? Well, I'm going to guess that it means a lot more muscle growth. Listen to me now so that I never have to repeat myself. If you take a lifter who is used to a certain amount of volume and you double up on that volume, they get fucking bigger. It's not a question and I'm not asking for your opinion on it. This is one of the most verifiable things in all of training. It's verified in anecdote. It's verified in the pro leagues. It's verified in the literature. When volume gets really high, lifters grow and they don't have to shit their pants on a crazy ass forced rep drop set clusterfuck in order to do it. Reason number three, it can be used with high intensity training. This is kind of the funny thing about volume. It allows for multiple approaches to be integrated where the high intensity training approach only allows for its own rigid set of rules. You can absolutely do balls to the wall fatigue work for your first set, rest, then do that 25 more times over seven different exercises. In fact, that is what many bodybuilders do. Now be careful, it doesn't work quite the same with really heavy compound movements as it does with smaller isolation work. You don't wanna run yourself into the ground. But as an approach for using regular bodybuilding style movements to get bigger and stronger over high rep sets, it absolutely does work. I do have to look at those who push the minimal amount of work as somehow being specially optimal or required as just trying to reinforce their own belief system. Training to failure is not exclusive to hit, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence in practice that those who limit their work to one or two sets are actually better for it. In fact, I wouldn't even mess with the second set. You wanna be very careful letting anyone know you did that because you wouldn't want to accidentally do too much work and get kicked out of the hit club. Doing very few sets in this way is viable, but it's not supreme. How you respond to any one dose of training is going to depend on your genetic predisposition along with what you are most adapted to right now. Remember, there's this thing called diminished returns. The same thing doesn't keep working indefinitely. Eventually, you need a new stimulus. So when you get used to the same type of training, it's nice to have an approach that allows you to make a change and reap the benefits of a new stressor. Reason number four, it's more reliable. Since we established that workouts with sufficiently high volume don't need to go to failure to show results, it is now possible to have punch the clock workouts. Feel like shit because your newborn kept you up last night? Get in your three to four sets on your five to six movements and call it a day. Work stress on your mind, making it hard to psych up for a lift? Just make the minimum jump in stress that you can that day and call it good. In this model, you can progress your training numerically. You can mess around with the variables. You can always find a way to make things harder without actually having to kill yourself. Progress does not have to be driven solely by soul crushing efforts. Not only does that give elite lifters more tools to work with when they have to walk the tightrope of recovery, but it makes a more reliable system for the average Joe, and that is priceless. Reason number five, it increases work capacity. Doing one hard effort and calling it good can absolutely give you a hit to your metabolism and spur some strength and endurance where there wasn't any before, but real capacity comes from repeated bouts where you build up a sucky amount of fatigue, rest, and then go right back to it again. It's a really nice bonus from hard volume based workouts that general capacity skyrockets from doing them. And that is especially important for athletes who might have to transition later on into a more strength specific block that can be really goddamn taxing. There's a current hopeful heir to the hit throne, a guy that wants to be the next Andrew Tate, but is actually closer to Sneeko. This individual routinely suggests that even strength athletes should do his 19 second tempo reps with 30% of your max bullshit and transition to strength specific work when they are in season and need to work on their skill. Even if this hypothetical lifter grew a bit of mass doing this, they're going to go into their regular ass event work and absolutely shit the bed from lack of capacity. If a power lifter spent three months putting on mass in this manner, the thought of doing repeating triples above 80% with any amount of effort or God forbid back off volume or AMRAPs would be absolutely out of the question. Take someone instead who trained like a normal human being and they're going to have a greater tolerance to volume, they're going to have more capacity and more preservation of skill in those particular movements. And that means they're going to be able to transition into their strength work much more easily. And guys, I'm super proud to have Boost Camp as a primary sponsor of this channel. Not only is Boost Camp the easiest and most intuitive way to track your training and your progress, 
Not only is it absolutely free to use, not only does it feature an immense library of some of your favorite programs, but it features an exclusive library of programs you will not find anywhere else. In fact, there's so much content there. I'm actually doing a series specifically dedicated to the programs that you will only find on Boost Camp. Stop what you're doing right now, click the link below, download Boost Camp. And guys, as I film this, this channel just hit 100,000 subs like five minutes ago, and that number would not have been possible without the support of sponsors like Boost Camp. Reason number six, it increases the calories that you burn throughout the day. The great thing about doing more work, it requires more energy. For any of you who are interested in keeping the waistline down, which I don't know why, you're all such beautiful flakes of snow, the number one concern is staying in a caloric deficit. So the choice for people that do wanna lean out is to either move more throughout the day or eat less. And eating less is really a worse option for someone wanting to slaughter a workout and have some energy left in the tank to spin some new muscle fibers. Working from home really throws a wrench in this. I spent way too much money on a Fitbit Charge 5 just to show me in no uncertain terms how little I actually move around all day. The hope was that I see the alerts and feel compelled to sneak in extra trips down the stairs or actually venture out into the neighborhood to avoid vitamin D deficiency and social retardation. But by doing volume in my workouts, I can sidestep all that. Committing to a workout that features 25 sets or more with difficult movements for reasonably high reps will substantially increase the number of calories you spend in a day. And that is a powerful tool for professional desk jockeys like myself who don't want to do an hour of mindless walking every day to meet their caloric goal. Number seven, despite what they tell you, it doesn't have to take three hours. Most guys who claim two and a half hour workouts are just spending 150 minutes at the gym because they don't have friends or anywhere else to be. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with jaw jacking at the gym. It's just as important a place of social engagement as any other, but don't let the chronic gym rats skew your idea of what high volume workouts really entail. I've had the privilege of training with a few competitive bodybuilders over the years, and the thing that stood out to me is that the pace is always blistering. Most don't go past 90 minutes because they simply couldn't sustain the pace for that long. I remember doing a shoulder workout with a large bodybuilding buddy of mine. This was at a time where I had a 335 strict press and I thought to myself, I'm gonna fucking win. What was I gonna win? I wasn't exactly sure, but I was gonna. As we started the workout, I was just absolutely blown away at the pace he kept. The rest breaks were just the time it took for the other guy to go. It was just round robin start to finish. While I started out heavier for the first one and a half sets of shoulder presses, I quickly had to drop the weight while he was able to sustain his weight basically the whole way through. We did 14 sets of shoulder presses, dumbbell raises, upright rows, and took a break just long enough to get an intra workout in while I hugged the swamp cooler, then did 14 more sets. All in all, it was an hour and 15 minutes, which was actually a lot less time than my usual bullshit two hour long strength specialist marathons where I was lucky to get double digit number of sets in. You don't have to kill yourself in this fashion, but moving quick and using things like antagonist supersets is a great way to keep volume high without living in the gym. Your kids and non-lifting spouse will thank you for the extra time, love, and attention you can now give them. Number eight, it is essential for strength. We touched on the skill component earlier, but I really have to drive home that volume is really non-optional for people wanting to build elite strength. A certain number of warm-up sets are required to feel ready before you get into your heavy working sets. A certain number of sets are required to solidify movement patterns and reinforce efficient mechanics. A certain number of sets are required to work variations of the main lift and smaller muscle groups that are necessary to reinforce weak areas and keep you well-rounded. This all equates to more work. Some might try to argue that skill is fundamentally different than strength because you can get really strong with a lift by becoming more efficient, almost like you're tricking yourself into moving more weight. And somebody who has a really strong muscle who should be able to lift a lot might not be able to because they're really inefficient in that particular movement. So they're kind of the same, but they're also very different. But in what world is it desirable to have a muscle that can fire with a ton of power, but can't express it in a coordinated effort on an external object? Strength is a holistic trait. It can only be represented and measured in a meaningful way by the complete demonstration of it using all of its constituent parts. The best proxy we have for strength that actually matters in real life is being able to lift a heavy object. And you do that by practicing the lift of heavy objects. Reason number nine, despite what the hit guys say, it's fucking hard, much harder than hit. I keep hearing all the mongoloids in the comments talk about the main reason that HIT isn't mainstream and that most pros don't do it is because it's just simply too hard. 
I'm dead serious. I've had like 200 average goons tell me that in the comment section. So let me get this straight, guys. The guy who is living in his car, eating tuna out of the can and making grapefruit fucking videos to support his gear habit so that he can potentially be the next great thing and get that IFBB Pro card, that guy isn't cut out for hit, but the average gerbil person milling around at a 24 hour fitness bothering the females in his line of sight should only be doing that. I contend that really aggressive volume workouts are actually mathematically much harder than hit. Remember when I said volume approaches can involve hit tactics? Well, take the horrifying pain that comes from the worst hit workout you've ever done and now just do it for a bunch of sets. Which is harder? The most famous maniacs of bodybuilding have found ways to get the most out of things like drop sets and force reps, but also recognize that the volume itself is actually a tool of torture in its own right. It turns out that taking squats to failure is a lot easier to do when you've done four sets of leg extensions with partial force reps and eccentric overload beforehand. I encourage anyone who thinks hit is especially hard to watch, I don't know, any fucking video of Tom Platts doing anything Bring on the puke bucket, boys. Come on! 45 fucking pounds! And finally, number 10. Greater control over sticky lifts and muscles that just won't grow. The thing that makes me most frustrated over the childish, oversimplified argument of this is better than that when comparing two modes of training is that every situation is somewhat different and depends on the individual. Consider an attempt to bring up a lagging muscle group. Are all of your muscles growing to grow at the exact same rate from the same one set to failure approach? Certainly not. After a few years of such training, even with a really well-rounded exercise selection, you might find that some muscles just don't fucking respond. So how does a hit advocate account for this? If your calves are stubborn, do you just keep going harder than freaking last time and hope for the best? Or do you maybe, just maybe, do more work on them than the other muscle groups? The fact is I've never heard somebody with sucky calves get around it with a minimalist approach like this. The rule is always to do a little bit more than you want to and then do a little bit more. And if you keep that up for a couple years, if you're lucky, you might grow some meat on those skinny little turkey legs. There's also a similar effect with movements that you may not respond to as well. If your legs and back are running wild, but your bench doesn't seem to be doing much of anything, just adding a few sets is one of the easiest things to do to spur new growth and get your bench moving again. Part of the way in which you respond might be genetic, might be related to your build, or just how much you hate the lift. Part of it might be that the same old bullshit has gotten stale and that particular movement needs a change. Either way, volume is the dial that turns the smoothest. So that's all I got for today, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Leave your questions and comments in the comments section. What opinions do you have about this? Uh, do you agree with this list or are you a hit fanatic that thinks I'm full of shit? Leave it all in the comments. I'm eager to hear what you guys think. Better yet, take it to Patreon. That is where I upload my training weekly and is where I answer questions directly from members. I do form checks. I give help with programming. I give life advice. Anything you want, any way you want to get in contact with me, that is the best place to do it. So don't forget to check that out. Thanks so much, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.